Welcome to the Essentials of Everfit program design educational series. My name is Trevor, and this is a collaboration between Everfit University and Empower Human Performance. So in this course, we're going to introduce some baseline foundational principles. We'll talk about being an educated coach, practitioner, and trainer. We'll dive into what entails a comprehensive assessment. We'll dive into creating a needs analysis, which is arguably the most important of creating a foundationally really solid program. We'll go into some of the baseline principles of exercise prescription, talk about some of the platform variables that are included in EverFit, such as tempo, and we'll also discuss some ancillary topics in exercise prescription, such as program design for conditioning or using AMRAPs um, and so on, EMOMs during program design. So before we get started, a quick in introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Trevor again. I'm an exercise physiologist at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I've coached NFL athletes, a few Olympians, and uh, hundreds of collegiate athletes. I've done over a thousand gait analysis with slow motion video capture. I currently sit on the National Strength and Conditioning Association board for Hawaii. Um, and previous to my role here in, at the university, I was a former COO of a multi-million dollar training studio in San Francisco. Uh, and I also got to play collegiate football. So I've definitely been uh, around the block a bit uh, and worked in a lot of different settings. Um, but a quick background on myself and why uh, I feel like I can sit here and have this conversation with you guys. So let's get into the content. Um, it's really important to consider as a coach, being an educated coach or trainer, and I want to talk about what that means. This doesn't mean that you got your college degree. This doesn't mean that you um, are consistently, you know, just, just reading articles or doing your thing, but it's that you employ a scientific method and have a systematic solution to problems that come up in your training, AKA, are you doing pre post test analysis on your clients or individuals that you work with? It's really, really important to understand that the basis of physiology is based around applying a stress and seeing how the body responds to that stress. So the reason we train is because we induce a stress and that our body responds to that stress by improving its functional capacity. Okay? So at the basis of our training, at the basis principle of stress and response, it's really important as practitioners to consider the scientific method to really, really educate ourselves on what's going on in that specific situation. Uh, we know there's a lot of basic principles like the principle of specificity and the principle of individuality that will really change how someone adapts to a specific stimulus. So with that, uh, if you have an athlete, client, uh, individual that you're working with, if there's something going on, it's really, really critical to continuously be coming up with hypotheses, continuously be collecting data uh, and, and know if that individual is improving pre-post and then kind of confirming or refuting your findings, aka okay, accepting or rejecting like, okay, my program is really solid. Let's say you have um, an individual that comes to you and they want to jump higher, right? In 12 weeks, are they jumping higher, jumping the same or not jumping as well? Right. That will tell you a lot about the training program that you employed, the stress, the stimulus, and maybe it's too much stress if they're not getting better, or maybe they have gotten a lot better. So it's really, really important to continue your practice as an exercise scientist, as a coach and trainer. Um, also, if you're not familiar with finding peer-reviewed articles, really, really critical to make sure that you're getting your resources from uh, validated sources. So using something like Google Scholar or uh, subscribing to a journal will be a great way to elevate your game as a coach and trainer. So the message really to drive home here is that we're all scientists, right? We are all exercise scientists. We are scientist coaches. We introduce a stimulus and we systematically evaluate this response pre-post. Okay, I'm going to put this individual through this program and I want this result. What separates the good from the great is quantifying that change and adapting either on the fly or reflecting backwards and optimizing that process 
So over the years, you can develop a really, really solid and sound program, which we're going to talk about how to create an optimized program today in this webinar. Okay. So do not forget, big takeaway, we are all exercise scientists. Make sure that you're doing pre-post test analysis, whether it's for their mile time, whether it's body fat percentage, weight, uh, one RM, whatever that variable might be, be sure that you're systematically evaluating your individual's responses to the training that you are prescribing them. Okay. All right, let's get into the primary content. So first thing we're going to talk about is a comprehensive assessment. Okay. So in most settings, it's really, really critical to have an entire comprehensive assessment about an, with an individual before you create a program. And you can do this multiple ways. If you work online, you can do this through Google Forms and videos, if you work in person um, and so on. But having a comprehensive assessment, creating a big picture and generalized look and view of an individual is a critical first step in, in creating a really sound program. Okay. So first step, informed consent, exercise pre-participation, health screening. This is more for a clinical setting. This also includes a liability waiver, but make sure you're coming correct with the paperwork and make sure that you're covering yourself. Second thing, pre-exercise evaluation. This is someone's goals, objectives, et cetera. This really is where the soft skills come in. So how is your ability to interact with your clients? How is your ability to get them to express their goals, get them to express the objectives, um, and really talk them into creating a smart goal, right? Finding a goal that's actually specific, measurable, has an action item, it's truly attainable, okay? Um, it's realistic and timely. So creating a proper smart goal will be huge in this first, first stage. Getting some resting measurements. Again, this could be clinical um, if needed, but this can be resting heart rate, resting blood pressure if needed, or if you're in a general pop or uh, sport performance setting this might not be as important but i still do like to get resting heart rate measures with anybody that i work with because heart rate variability definitely has a sway and tells you a lot about the training st stress and stimulus that somebody might be on okay um, and then getting into the specifics so these are the ones that are critical and absolutely should be always included in a comprehensive initial assessment either circumference or body composition analysis ideally both but getting someone's circumferences analyzing their body fat percentage uh, and their lean muscle mass or lean mass percentage is gonna be critical, especially to be able to show them pre-post changes. Measuring cardio respiratory fitness. So this could be a 1.5 mile run test. This could be if you have access of VO2 max test. This could be a critical power test. There's a lot of ways to define and measure cardio respiratory fitness, but this should also be one primary component of the comprehensive assessment. Measuring muscular fitness. So muscular fitness uh, included in that term is both muscular endurance as well as muscular strength. So getting a percent uh, or getting a one RM value from repetition maximum testing, as well as measuring their muscular endurance and measuring flexibility slash mobility will be critical as well. This doesn't all have to be done on the same day, but when you first initially get somebody, an individual, there are definite ways to create cookie cutter templates and programs for a lot of people. But if you do the comprehensive assessment, you can accurately prescribe correctives, accurately uh, identify rate limiting factors and really optimize this individual's time with you. Because if they're already really, really strong, let's say they're already barbell back squatting two and a half times their body weight, right? But they're really, really lacking cardiorespiratory fitness, depending on their goals, if they want to become a more healthy, quote unquote, healthy individual, they should probably spend some time really, really digging into the cardiorespiratory fitness phase. So that will change how you allocate your exercise prescription based on their strengths and weaknesses. So a comprehensive assessment is a, a critical first step in, in a solid program design. And so with that, that really, uh, kind of define the five components of health related fitness. So in most fitness settings, individuals want one of three things. They either want to lose weight, gain muscle mass. So lose weight by decreased body fat percentage, gain muscle mass, or improve performance in some type of sport activity and so on. And that's a generalization, but most people are going to want to do that. And so within that, if you consider the five components of health related 
fitness, if an individual, individual wants to become more healthy or whatever that might be, these five components are probably the most important from a health standpoint to measure. So cardiovascular endurance, muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, and body composition. In other words, what these five variables really mean is that if you're improving one of these five things, you're improving this individual's health. And that's really, really important, not only to understand, but also to relay to your clients that, hey, okay, you want to become a more healthy individual. These five components really define health-related fitness. Okay? Here's what you're strong in. Here's what you're weak in. And you can show pre-post adaptations at four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks of training and so on. Uh, but these five components are really going to be kind of the, the basis foundational principles and, and variables to focus on when considering health related fitness and the essentials within health. Yeah. All right. Um, so once you've done the comprehensive analysis, let's say you have a lot of information on this individual and their mobility, their strength, their weaknesses, their fitness level, their mental status profile. The next step is developing a needs analysis. And I think the needs analysis, to be honest, is the most important and critical part of a trainer practitioner's role, okay, is creating a proper needs analysis. I think the details within the needs analysis separate good trainers from elite trainers. And what a needs analysis is, is it's basically an in-depth analysis of the physical demands of this individual's life, their sport and physical demands, and their mental profile, right? So what a needs analysis entails, and we'll talk about some of the, the specifics as we get in a little bit deeper here, but what is the needs or the demands that are placed on this individual in their life, in their sport, in their physical, mental world and realm, right? And is there, uh, what's their rate limiting factor? Okay. So out of, after like the assessment and you have the information, which of these variables is limited, which can you help improve their capacity, their functional capacity to do that thing? So you do have some pr common primary objectives within this decrease the risk of injury, enhance performance, reach desired goal, or enhance their quality of life. Again, these are just common and generalizations, but Let's take an example of a collegiate athlete, for example, a soccer player. The depth that you can go in the needs analysis really, really will separate how solid your program is. So you can think about bioenergetic specificity. What energy system are they predominantly using in their sport or do they need to perform in their sport? Where are they strong and where are they weak? Therefore, where should you allocate a big chunk and percentage of their training, right? Um, within that, you have the biomechanical specifics of this collegiate athlete. Let's say they're a soccer player. In soccer, the gait looks slightly different than it might look in long distance running, specifically because there's a ball involved. So a lot of times people are looking at the ground. There's more forward lean. There's a lot more acceleration involved. So are you going to spend a lot more time working on top speed with the soccer player? Or are you going to work more on footwork, mechanics, and acceleration profile within the soccer pl player as well? Um, other things that will come up in the needs analysis is individuals, uh, injury history, right? Their risk of injury, um, common injuries that happen in the sport and so on. So you can go really, really deep and take a deep dive in the needs analysis for each individual. But if you create a solid foundation of the needs analysis, what you'll realize is that it's all about the details. So a really, really great needs analysis will one, identify the needs and demands of the individual in their life. Two, identify the stresses and stimulus that are already present in that person's life. AKA, if they're a basketball player and they're playing five or six times a week for a couple hours, you might not necessarily need to train them for those basketball specific movements because they're already doing it so much that maybe you need to work on those other things that they're not getting, right? And work around those other baseline principles to improve their capacity, their functional capacity to play. Let's say they're a tech worker that works in the Bay Area. They're spending a lot of time sitting, right? So as the trunk is flexed forward, as the hips might lock up and they might decrease their ability to access the glute, that will also really impact the organization of your training, which exercises come first, uh, and also the 
allocation of time towards specific details, correctives, strength training, and so on, compared to if this individual is walking quite a bit throughout the day and so on. Okay. So how deep that you take your needs analysis will directly relay into how well you can improve this person's functional capacity by creating a really solid program. Right. Now, if the individual doesn't stick with the program and adherence and other things, those are other, other topics and, and concepts, but at the basis of creating a solid program lies the needs analysis. Okay. So let's get into the specific tracking fields that lie within EverFit. Okay. And before we go there, I think it's really important to consider the basic principles of exercise prescription so how to create an exercise program and really how to optimize your time spent on the EverFit platform okay? and how to create a really solid, effective program to improve your client's lifestyle, strength, performance, whatever that might be. Okay? So we have the FIT VP principle. Uh, this comes from the ACSM guidelines, but basically you have some really, really basic and simple principles that underlie how programs can be modified and how they can be created. So you have the frequency, i.e. how often does someone train? You have the intensity. This can be how hard. This can also be considered the load. Um, you have time, duration, or how long they're training. Type, the mode or what type. So um, type could be elliptical, bike, uh, treadmill, or it could also be resistance training, plyometric training, and so on. You have total volume, which is the total amount. So total volume can be quantified by a really common way to do it is just total pounds moved in a session, AKA sets times uh, reps times the weight, right? So you can basically take that approach and quantify total volume. Other ways to quantify total volume might include ground contact times and something like plyometrics. And so this is really um, giving a value to the total volume associated with the training session. And then progression. So how are you planning to progress your clients from a week to week, month to month, uh, microcycle to microcycle level? How are you progressing your client from where they are today towards their goal, whatever that might be from six months, a year from now, whenever it is, what is your game plan and approach to progressing that athlete or individual to reach that specific performance level? Okay. So something that's foundational uh, to consider before creating an exercise program is one, how do you measure muscular strength? How do you predict and create a value to use this value to create a eight week, 12 week training program based on this value? Okay. So I'm sure you've heard of the term one repetition maximum, right? So one RM is the greatest resistance that can be moved through a full range of motion in controlled manner with good posture. What's good and bad about the 1RM is, yes, this, is, this represents the greatest resistance that an individual can move. It truly does uh, define individ individual's muscular strength. However, most people, I would say, have the capacity to maybe do a 1RM testing or shouldn't be, but it's really going to increase their risk of injury. And in a lot of settings and a lot of populations, it's not a good idea to do a true maximum 1RM testing. 1RM test and to put people through that type of stress and load. Um, one, from injury risk standpoint, two, that stress might be way higher than the load that they can handle, um, which might put them into uh, a bit of a, you could say, it, it will just put them possibly at risk for injury. Let's just say that. Um, so measuring muscular strength is really important, but in order to get a one rep max value, you have to have somebody do a 1RM, right? However, that's risky. So the repetition maximum prediction method is really, really popular across all, all walks and practices in the kinesiology realm. Basically, what this is doing is using some repetition maximum. So let's say you load up the bar, you have somebody go through warm up sets and so on. And then your goal, you're going to have them do you're comfortable and know that they can do eight repetitions of a certain uh, weight. So you're going to have them do no less than eight repetitions. You're going to have them keep increasing the load with proper rest period and so on. And so they can do somewhere between, let's say six to 10 repetitions, ideally landing on eight. Whenever they fail at that highest workload between six to 10 repetitions, you can use the values associated with that. So you can use the weight and repetitions 
to calculate and predict someone's 1RM without putting them at that big risk of injury from 1RM testing itself, from actually moving a true 1RM. Okay. So EverFit uses the Epley equation in the EverFit platform. You can take a look at the validity, reliability, um, and so on of the Epley equation by what we talked about earlier, going hopping on a Google Scholar um, and looking into the equation. There's three or four primary equations that are used across, across the industry, but Epley is a really, really solid, relatively accurate equation, really, really great to use. So if you see the 1RM being predicted from someone's workout on EverFit, this is because EverFit is using the natural relationship between percent 1RM and how many reps an individual can do. For example, let's say most people on average have five repetitions, right? The five repetition maximum, that's equivalent to 85% of their 1RM. As an example, that's the same way that EverFit uses the Epley equation to provide your clients with, hey, here's your new one repetition maximum. Congratulations, this is the highest that you've ever had. It's because they moved a weight more times than they ever had at that specific weight AKA the prediction equation will bump up their 1RM and they'll be stronger, okay? Um, so measuring muscular strength is a really important concept that's at the basis of creating a good problem. And the reason being is that repetition maximum will allow you to predict the 1RM and then based on the 1RM, certain percentages of an individual's 1RM can be used to elicit specific responses, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so just a recap on the repetition maximum. RM is used when the population being tested is not safe to push to maximal exertion or during training programs. So another way to use repetition maximum training in a way that I really like to is within auto-regulation. So let's say you get an individual and you create a program, a 12-week training program, right? Throughout the course of those 12 weeks, there's a lot of life stresses that are occur. There's a lot of ups and downs and fluctuations that are going to occur within that program. So is it safe to say that you should base that entire program based on their initial week one repetition maximum prediction? You could, but is it going to limit your capacity to improve this person's function within those 12 weeks? Maybe, maybe not, but I think it's best to auto-regulate, to adjust with the individual. So for example, a good example of auto-regulation is at the last set of a working series, right? So let's say somebody is working on five by five, classic five by five strength training. The last set of five, if you prescribe a load of let's say 225 pounds on back squat, you let them on that last set do as many reps as you can, as they can, okay? Of course, with the spotter or um, a asterisk, as many reps as you can, if they don't have a spotter with good form and so on, but Let's say you prescribe them at this load, they should be able to do five reps based on the algorithm. Okay. They all of a sudden complete 12 repetitions. Okay. You know, this individual had a really, really immediate strength response to the training. So they probably haven't been training too long. Their 1RM already is a lot higher than what it was, or maybe they're sandbagging it in the testing or whatever it might be. Now you can, through EverFit, auto regulate their training right? Adapt on the fly. Be like, okay, here's your new one RM. And now let's get even closer to the accurate characteristic and profile trainings loads that we want to be within to improve endurance, hypertrophy, strength, power, whatever that might be. Okay. Um, so that's a really good way to use auto regulation within that uh, EverFit program. So I have some questions here um, just for you to think about who do you assume is safe to do one RM testing? Um, and who would you assume to do a repetition maximum test and estimate? I think a really simple and clear way to put this is someone with a very long training history, maybe two to three years, you can assume it's relatively safe to do a 1RM. Even at that point, it might not be the best idea, especially if this is an athlete in season um, and so on. So you really want to consider, is it really a good time or do you want to increase the risk of this individual? Um, or who would you assume is best to do a repetition maximum and estimate this is going to be your higher at risk populations. Um, and then with those populations, usually a really conservative approach should be used. This is a 10 to 15 repetition maximum. This is in your truly high risk. So this is like your clinical population, um, like type setting, but with that even 10 to 15 repetition maximum, 
yeah, it might not give you the most accurate strength 1RM level, but it will give you an idea of this individual's functional capacity at that time to be a good exercise scientist and a good coach practitioner to say, okay, this individual improved their capacity pre to post their predicted strength is here. Post training, their predicted strength had improved and so on. There is, however, a really important uh, assumption to consider in repetition maximum testing. And that's that the athlete or individual provided a genuine maximum effort. Okay. So let's say the individual just based on motivation or whatever it could be, they stopped at nine repetitions, but they could have done 10, right? They could have done 10. So this individual's program based on the repetition maximum uh, equation their program, all the weights, every lift that they do is going to be slightly less than it would have been if they do 10 repetitions. Okay. So there is assumptions associated repetition maximum, which is why I think it's really, really important to employ auto regulation and to track an athlete's one rep max, specifically their predicted one rep max throughout a training cycle. That way you can regulate, increase it, decrease it, and so on as this individual transitions through your training. All right. And then let's dive into uh, the needs analysis. And more specifically, we're going to go um, take it back. Sorry, that slide's a little out of place. Um, we'll go into the principles now of the, uh, that we talked about earlier. So with this, let's first, let's dive into intensity. So how hard? Um, intensity or load. So with this, we have, if you have the, an individual's one repetition maximum, right? Um, the percent of their one RM is a good way to gauge the intensity. So this will give you a weight. So the NSCA National Strength and Conditioning Association, um, these are block categories. So if you train less than 67%, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get hypertrophy and that you're not going to improve strength. However, you're going to mostly be improving endurance if you're training less than 67% of 1RM. If you're training between 67 to 85%, you're going to have a big hypertrophic adaptation. It's not to say that you're not going to improve endurance or not improve strength. Okay. And if you're training higher than 85%, you will be increasing an in individual strength as well as gaining the hypertrophy, um, hypertrophic adaptation that you would be getting in the 67 to 85% range, okay? So these are generalizations, but it's really important to know, okay, where is my individual training based on their percent one RM? Am I gonna periodize them from a endurance training block to a hypertrophy block to a strength block, right? How do you want to load this individual? How do you wanna progress your loading the individual through their intensity? Other ways to measure intensity would be an RPE. Um, so I like an Everfit, RPE, you'll find RPE is present. I'll actually prescribe an uh, exercise um, for an individual, let's say it's bench press. So set one is going to be a six out of 10 RPE. Set two is going to be a seven out of 10. Set three is going to be an eight. Set four is going to be a nine. So let's say they have four sets of five, right? On that last rep, I want them to be at a six, seven, eight, and nine out of 10. So the good thing about that is this is a solid way to auto-regulate program design and help your athlete feel, start to feel where their predicted percentages, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% might be, right? Based on that, that load and intensity. So another way to uh, track intensity is through the RPE. Um, and then for endurance program prescription or just for conditioning cardio type loads, heart rate is a really, really good way to measure intensity and more specifically heart rate zones. Okay, and we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. The other thing we talked about is total volume. Okay. So total volume is the amount. So total volume, uh, some var variables measured that, excuse me, some variables that are used to measure volume. You have your sets and reps. Okay. So you can multiply the sets, how many sets this individual did times how many reps that they did, right? Combine that with their total weight. Then you'll know their total pounds or kilograms in that training session specifically. You can also quantify total volume by time. Okay. So this is really important to track for stress and strain progression as well as periodization. All right. 
So when considering aerobic program design, some of the other uh, variables that are included in the EverFit platform, you have time. So are you going to have this individual run for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, hour, two hours, whatever it might be. You have the speed. So you, if they're using a treadmill, this is a really good way to um, prescribe someone to train at a specific speed or pace. Cadence. So cadence is how many steps an individual is taking per minute, right? And then you have the distance if they're doing long distance training or short distance training, AKA, are they going to be doing repeated sprints or repeated 200 meter workouts, or you're going to have them do a long, slow training style session. All right. Another variable that's really, really important to consider that can really change the scope of a workout session is rest time. So rest time, I think is something that a lot of coaches, practitioners aren't measuring as much as they possibly should. Um, and more specifically, it's really important to measure rest time because rest, right? The longer that you have to rest, the more ATP that the body will be able to regenerate and utilize in that next set. Okay. So with that, yes, that can be important if you want to improve someone's overall quality. For example, if you really want to improve someone's vertical jump, you probably should not have them doing really, really short rest type loads uh, or short rest intervals with high load because they're not going to be able to jump as high as they possibly can by the time that they're redoing that next exercise or that next set. So you want to have a long, a long work to rest ratio there to allow them to fully perform. Whereas in, if you want to apply a bioenergetic stress, right? If you want to get somebody really conditioned and improve their average power output or average force output or average movement quality, right? then having a shorter rest time will be good because this will have more of a bioenergetic demand. So this all goes back to the needs analysis. What is the work to rest ratio of this individual? What are their needs? Are they really, really fit within the phosphagen system, but they have really, really poor cardio? Do they need better cardio? Are they still subpar with the phosphagen system and so on? So having a really, really good needs analysis will directly translate into how you prescribe rest time. Okay. So with this, to go over this table really quickly, we have four primary energy system pathways. Okay, we have the phosphagen system, which occurs all out movements from zero to 10 seconds. Proper work to rest ratio here is one to 12. So let's say you assign an individual a 10 second sprint, for example, a 10 second all out sprint. To optimize the work to rest ratio with this should be one to 12. So that 10 seconds, multiply it by 12, 120 seconds, two minutes. So 10 seconds on, two minutes off, 10 seconds on, two minutes off. Sounds like a long, long rest period, right? But if you consider all out full body uh, stimulus, AKA a 10 second sprint somewhere around hundred meters, 80 to hundred meters, right? That's going to be a lot of stimulus and they're going to actually really need that two minutes to recover. And as you transition down the columns here, you can see that we work from the phosphagen system, fast glycolytic, so glycolytic to the oxidative system. And again, the work to rest ratios kind of decrease with that uh, load and, and intensity specifically. So phosphagen system um, bout would be most intense. Oxidative system bout would be least intense. So it takes more time to recover from phosphagen bout right, than it would to recover from a oxidative bout if they were the same duration. However, they have different durations, um, but all in all to make sure that you get the primary takeaway here is that based on how long you're prescribing exercises, right? There are optimal work to rest ratio zones. And this is specific to improving somebody's performance, right? Not necessarily their energetic capacity. So for example, something like Tabata, 20 seconds on 10 seconds off, right? That does not fit into this work to rest ratio um, column here from the NSCA. However, what that's going to do is really stress the bioenergetic system, right? And so the bioenergetics will have a big functional adaptation from that. And that individual will become a lot more fit from that, from a bioenergetic standpoint, but maybe not from a peak power output or peak performance standpoint. All right. And then we're going to transition on into some ancillary topics and exercise prescription.
All right, so let's cruise into set progression. So training sets should transition from a warm up load to a working set load. And, and what I'm really getting here to, like what I'm really getting to here is that exercise prescription should follow a pattern of building up to a specific workload. And what that means and what we're getting to is you don't want to just start someone out and say, okay, I want you to do three sets of five at 85% of your max. And you just load up the bar and get them into it. We need warm up loads. We need movement prep. We need some type of exercise exercises previous to work that individual up to that working set load. So if you're working sets, if you want to have an individual do three sets of five at a working load at 85%, you might actually have six sets of five prescribed one set, set one might be 50% for five, set two might be 60%, set three might be 70%, and then set four, they're at 85%. But training sets should transition from a warm up load to the working set load throughout the course of someone's training session. So, an example here is using RPE, as I talked about before. Set one, six out of 10, set two, seven out of 10, set three, eight out of 10. Okay, so progressing, progressing in intensity each set. All right, and then tempo. So tempo is something that's gaining a lot of popularity um, in the training realm. So tempo, what is tempo? Um, so, and why would we use tempo is another good question as well. So tempo, tempo just basically manipulates the speed of which you move throughout different portions of a lift. So the first number in tempo here, uh, this represents the eccentric phase. So this is the lowering phase or as the muscle is lengthening. So let's use a squat, for example, that's why I said lowering, would be a three second eccentric lowering. Okay, so three seconds down, three, two, one, you're now at the bottom of a squat, okay? The second number is a pause at the sticking point. You can think about this as the 90 degree joint flexion uh, point, but this basically is the bottom of the movement. Wherever this individual bottoms out or end range there is the pause. So second number is a pause. So this is a one second pause. Third number is the concentric or muscle shortening. This would be the way up from a barbell back squat. And the fourth number is the pause at the top of a lift. So what tempo does is it provides a lot of instruction into how the athlete should move. So a lot of a lot of people when they lift and train would just go through the motions, AKA, okay, I have a set of 10 down and up, down and up, down and up and so on. But if you manipulate tempo, so tempo can increase or manipulate the time under tension that an individual has. And it also can add purpose um, to power as well. So it can add some specificity and purpose to training. So you can see the X here, the third, um, third variable in the sequence. So, the X stands for move as fast as you can. So this individual in this, in this specific tempo would be lowering themselves slowly for three seconds, pausing for a second at the bottom, and then having an all out acceleration to back to the top of the lift and immediately going back into another eccentric uh, portion, three seconds down and back up. Let's say it's for five repetitions. Okay. So what we know about muscle hypertrophy, there's really three ways to stimulate muscular hypertrophy in a general sense, you can either apply a lot of tension to the muscle, AKA a lot of sheer tension, strength training. You can increase an individual's time under tension or their volume, or you can apply a bioenergetic stress and demand. Okay. So what you can do with tempo is you can really manipulate the time under tension. You can, for example, this set that a person would do, if they did five repetitions here, with three seconds down, one second pause at the bottom. And let's say it takes another second for them to get to the top. That's a five second uh, repetition. Whereas in somebody just going down and up, right? Maybe it's two seconds, one second down, one second up and so on. So you can manipulate the time under tension to improve the hypertrophic adaptation, improve someone's muscle size through tempo training. All right. There are a lot of different set types that are included in the EverFit platform. Primarily, there's four. So you have the warm-up, also known as movement prep. So you can, you can allocate an uh, exercise 
to be a warm up set. And that will let your client or individual know that this is just a warm up set, or it's also known as movement prep. That might be for a bench press, for example, some push ups or something similar. Okay. Um, the next set type that you have is a regular or working site, working set. These are sets prescribed to elicit desired responses. So these are really those sets that you're pre-programming and allocating specific workloads to, let's say 85% of 1RM, because you want to improve this individual strength. Okay. Something else that's really common um, in the kinesiology realm is called a drop set. Um, so a drop set is used to increase power output and can cause neurological and psychological adaptations. So a drop set is basically when you build up to a heavy weight. So let's say you've, you're building up or whatever weight it might be. And the following set, you drop weight from the bar. So you drop weight. Let's say you built up to a 500-pound uh, back squat, and you're going to drop this individual back down to 315, just three plates on the bar. Okay. What's going to happen when that individual gets under the bar? Basically, the nervous system and the, the uh, physiology of the nervous system is going to assume that the same load, relatively the same load, is on the bar. So... Um, acetylcholine and calcium and, and all sorts of these chemicals that are involved in the central nervous system process and activation process of the nervous system are going to accumulate and be in that area that's going to uh, activate the muscle fibers in the legs. Basically, it's going to be stoked. It's going to be totally psyched. And what will happen when you pop the bar off, it'll feel pretty light. When you get to the bottom of the squat and go to accelerate upward, your neurological system is going to kind of kick into overdrive and you'll have a really, really powerful drive up from the bottom. So drop sets are used to increase power output. Drop sets are also used to increase volume in a training session because we know that uh, an individual's bar speed is directly associated to how many reps in reserve they, they can do. Okay. In other words, as people are training, let's say bench press to failure, the last couple sets, they're going to, or the last couple repetitions, they're going to really slow down. And as the bar speed slows, that's directly associated with how many reps in reserve that individual has left. So by doing a drop set, if you can increase the bar speed in the first couple repetitions, you might increase their volume also at that working load. Okay. So lots of reasonings and rationale behind using drop sets. But again, it's just working up to a relatively heavier load and then dropping the weight to get that feeling. Um, and then the last uh, set type is failure set. So sets to failure should, I think should be used sparingly and always require a spotter. Um, however, they can be used for auto-regulation and testing throughout program design. So failure sets shouldn't, I don't think should be something that are used all the time in every single training session throughout all the sets. However, if you're gonna include one set to failure, let's say they're doing bench press, five sets of five on the very last set, if you're going to allow them to open up in what's called a open set, do as many repetitions as you can with the last prescribed weight, that will allow you to see their growth pattern and how much strength that they're, they're putting on, right? And again, as we talked about being an educated coach practitioner, if you're noticing that it's been eight weeks in a relatively untrained or moderately trained population and they're not getting a lot stronger, that's when it's time to really reconsider what type of training stimulus that they're under, really consider the training load, how you're testing your athletes and so on to adapt on the fly and be sure to optimize the functional capacity improvements that you're going to be delivering to your, your clientele. Okay. So some other important ancillary topics, we have progression and regression. So progression and regression. So basically anytime that you prescribe an exercise to someone, you always want to think about a progression and a regression. And reason being is that basically you want to have a harder exercise on deck as well as an easier exercise on deck because you want the athlete or individual, right? So if you prescribe something that doesn't go as planned or it's too easy for them or it's too hard for them, you want to be able to have something in your pocket that's basically the same movement, right? Uh, or same, yeah, same movement, but slightly different load or take weight off the bar or whatever that is. Um, so a good example of this would be uh, if you prescribe somebody a, let's say, side, like a mini side plank with abduction. So they're on their side in the side plank position, the bottom leg's bent, and they're lifting their top leg up and down off the ground. And for one individual in, let's say it's a group class or, or one client, you prescribe them the same program. It's too easy. Okay, let's get into a full plank position. So a full side plank with abduction. 
increase the intensity, that's a progression. Let's say X athlete is having a hard time with that movement. You can regress the movement by having them lay all the way down onto their side. Head is uh, basically resting on the arm. And now they're going through abduction from a sideline position without having to stabilize through the plank. So having a progression or regression on deck is critical. Everfit also has uh, space for alternate exercises. So the reason to prescribe alternate exercises, this might be based on equipment, injury history, or preferences. And a good example here is barbell front squat to a goblet squat. So let's say, for example, in your programming, you have um, you want to train someone in their squatting pattern, specifically if anterior chain loaded squ squatting pattern. However, you prescribe it to this individual and they've been going to a gym, but they're traveling. The travel gym that they're at doesn't have barbell. Okay. So you can have in your program design alternate exercise for goblet squat. Therefore, they know, okay, no worries. I'm just going to grab a 60 pound dumbbell, hold it by the sides, and I'll go through this front squat movement. This will still load the movement, but it'll be an alternate exercise based on their equipment. They might also have an injury history. For example, a lot of people get injured deadlifting. They might not want to do a bilateral barbell deadlift, but they might be open to doing a single leg RDL with a kettlebell or something similar. Okay. Um, and also preferences as well. So having an alternate exercise on deck is also really critical for effective program design. Okay. And let's also get into uh, some other set types. So we're in our ancillary topics in program design. So supersets. Supersets are really, really popular. Um, superset essentially is two sequentially performed exercises that stress two opposing muscles or areas. Okay. So a superset is the agonist, the primary mover, okay. And the antagonist. So a really, really easy way to think about this is a bicep and tricep doing a, uh, let's say a barbell bicep curl and a cable tricep extension with a rope. Okay. Doing them one after another is considered a superset because you are training the agonist primary mover and the antagonist, the opposite. Okay. A compound set is when you prescribe two sequentially performed exercises that stress the same muscle group. Something that I see this in um, sometimes an easy way to think about this is for example, we have two bicep heads or we have two hamstring heads, right? Having different changes in the rotation of the arm forearm or, um, or the femur and uh, lower limb can change the mechanics of which muscle is training. So for example, to make it really simple, a compound set might be doing a bicep curls followed by a hammer curl, right? It's the same muscle group, possibly different my biomechanical load. Okay. But you're compounding on that same muscle group. That's a compound set. Um, and then we have giant sets or quadruplex. So a giant set is usually a group of three or four exercises, uh, and then quadruplex is really taken over in the functional training realm. Um, but this is usually when you're grouping four exercises combined into one circuit, circuit style training. Um, something that I do a lot with my athletes that are in this uh, type of training program is an upper body, lower body, single leg balance and core exercise as a circuit. So let's say, for example, they're doing an upper body, again, to keep it really simple, just upper body bench press lower body barbell squat, uh, single leg balance. Let's say it's doing some single leg RDLs with the airplane. So opening up and then rush and twist for core, something really simple. Um, but you can circuit through these movements. And the good thing about thinking about giant sets or quadruplex training is that you can keep individuals really, really active without taxing and challenging the same muscle group. So you can tax somebody's upper body, have them immediately walk over into a preset up lower body station, have them from that lower body go into an unloaded single leg balance type exercise, and then wrap up with core. By the time that they finish this entire circuit, right after they go through lower body, single leg and core, their upper body will most likely be almost recovered. So that way they can hop right into it. So this is really good for weight loss clients as well um, to be able to get a lot of volume. Or if you're in a personal training setting, when you're doing sessions every 50 minutes, right? You only have 10 minutes on the hour. How am I going to get in a big training stimulus? So this type of circuit training, giant sets of quadruplex training are really, really effective considerations as well. All right. And then to wrap up, we're going to talk about exercise prescription for conditioning. 
So there's lots of different ways to prescribe exercises for conditioning. And I'm using conditioning as a really, really broad term, but this is really your Metcon type conditioning at the end of a training session, right? Um, but training models based on max number of repetitions or rounds have really been increasing in popularity. Okay, so you have AMRAP workouts, EMOM workouts, right? These things are really, really getting popular in the fitness community. So the benefits include exercise prescriptions for groups, pre-post data, and it accounts for intraset fatigue. So it allows individuals to rest and recover intrasets. However, there are some problems, considerations, not huge ones, but it's hard to control and, and really like, it's hard to control the magnitude of the training load. And what I mean by that is if you have a AMRAP workout, right? Or a EMOM workout, let's say EMOM is a little easier to explain. So let's say you're doing every minute on the minute and you're having people do, let's say 20 jump squats, right? And then they change to a different exercise. So for individuals that are relatively more fit, they might finish those 20 jump squats earlier, which means that they have more time to rest than an individual that's relatively less fit, right? Because you're doing every minute on the minute, you're basically have to complete this exercise within the minute. And then you get however long is left to rest, right? So EMOMs are really, really great thing. There's nothing against EMOM, but what you need to consider and at least be aware of is that really controlling the magnitude of the load as well as rest interval characteristics are really challenging within that specific type of program design, okay? So EMOM, every minute on the minute training does challenge individuals with lower levels of fitness. It is a little more challenging for individuals with lower levels of fitness because they might not be able to complete everything as quickly as somebody that's more fit. It doesn't mean that you don't prescribe that for them. It just means that if you're in a group setting that you're aware of, keep an eye on the individuals that are possibly less fit, maybe cutting them off early and so on, just pivoting, just being aware is really going to help you out in this setting. Okay. Um, AMRAP workouts, as many repetitions as possible. Okay. So AMRAP workouts uh, are used in research to measure volitional fatigue. Okay. So an AMRAP workout is a lot different than a set to failure. So an AMRAP workout is when you're doing, okay, you're going to do as many of these as you can in five minutes. You're going to do as many of these as you can and so on. AMRAP as many reps as possible as a training set to failure is what's used in volitional fatigue um, research papers to identify when someone reaches fatigue. Okay. So I want to make sure there's a clear difference between an AMRAP workout for maybe time or training to failure at the end of a set, which that type of as many reps as possible is used to measure volitional fatigue in research. Okay. AMRAP is really, really effective um, training strategy to use. However, it could increase the risk of injury if you're not really familiar with your athlete and the training load that they're able, how much stress is this individual able to handle? Okay. So you want to make sure that you really come correct with the training volume if you are prescribing AMRAP workouts. Another way to prescribe um, exercises for conditioning, time workouts. Um, I like time workouts. So let's say 30 seconds of the bike, for example. So 30 seconds of the assault bike followed by 30 seconds of the rope. That in itself is going to have a really, really high glycolytic energy system stress. So time workouts can be assigned for specific bioenergetic system stress, AKA fostered in system, 10 to 15 seconds, right? All out ropes for 15 seconds, no holding back. Okay. That's a really, really good way to tax that type of system. So if you are prescribing exercises for a group that needs to improve a certain bioenergetic system, then it's really, really critical to use time workouts because with the time workouts, you can also have a predetermined work to rest ratio that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And with that, that takes us directly into the next type of workout, interval workouts. So with interval workouts, you have predetermined work to rest ratios and load or AMRAP. Something really important, um, really popular, for example, is Tabata 20 seconds on 10 seconds off. Um, if you've ever done a Tabata workout, they're definitely incredibly demanding. Um, and they're usually demanding because you have a two to one work to rest ratio, whereas the NSCA never uh, suggests going higher than one to one. It means that you're doing twice the work as the rest that you're getting, which means that your body's going to gas out relatively quickly, right? This is good 
if you're able to manage the training volume and load, and if you're aware with a proper needs analysis of the type of training stimulus that the individuals in your group or clients need. So it's got to be really specific to the needs of that individual. Okay. Um, so with that exercise prescription for conditioning overall, there's a lot of ways to prescribe exercises for conditioning. Um, they've gotten really popular. I think the most valuable one to consider is usually the interval workouts or the timed workouts, and then just be careful with AMRAP workouts, just because it does increase the, the risk of injury for some individuals when they're going to failure. Right. And then EMOM workouts are really great. I absolutely love them. You just want to keep an eye on and be aware of its challenge that it places on individuals with lower levels of fitness. Awesome. So that concludes the essentials of EverFit program design series. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or anything that you want to bring up, um, feel free to shoot me an email. We will share contact info and so on following this presentation. Hope you enjoyed. Feel free to reach out, please, anytime, and be on the lookout for a couple more educational series coming from EverFit University.